So I'm Lee Gates. I've worked with some of you in the past. I came to Oracle about a year and a half ago. Spent a lot of time at a um, storage hardware provider who was focused on ma making it to cloud, providing private storage for cloud. So I'm kind of a data focused guy. I like the idea that data is the one persistent resource or persistent asset that's created by IT as networks come and go, as compute comes and goes. Uh, and as all the other pieces come and go, that data management is actually the responsibility of the enterprise, and that's been very exciting to me. Before working there, I spent a long time um, at a large uh, consumer software provider, and we can tell stories there as well. So with that, <coughs> please ask questions as we go along. I will talk to the, frame, the, the context slide, and then I think what we'll do is go straight into the demo, and then I'll go back to the slides to tie it together. So before I... As, as, uh, so I'll go through this. So um, I came to Oracle to focus on block storage, file storage, and performance. Um, after launching uh, the block service and actually uh, launching our, our cloud initially uh, October of 2016, I had the opportunity to spend full time on performance, um, which was pretty exciting for me. Uh, and one of the stories that I tell people is on-premise sales is oftentimes an engineer showing up with a box underneath his arm to go in your data center and hangs out with your, your staff for several weeks. Sometimes it's a very interesting experience. But cloud is all about showing the performance, addressing that question, and moving on to the business value for the conversation. So um, I believe that the benchmarks I run and others run should be runnable <coughs> by you and runnable by your customers or those that you do business with uh, without much proprietary or historical advanced knowledge should be self-explanatory to the uh, reasonably astute observer. So we want to demystify performance. So I have been focused on the enterprise, like I note here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the work with Gartner that I've been driving. Uh, the decisions team uh, is based on their Cloud Harmony acquisition. Uh, I can detail for you why uh, I spend time there, but in essence, they do a lot of uh, interesting measurements, uh, and it's very good for Oracle to be there. And of course, I use some of those uh, measurement tools uh, in some of my blogs and some of my resources. Lastly, on the enterprise focus, if you want to do testing with me on performance, mail me. So recently, I spent time with storagereview.com. They published a very flattering piece on us. It was hands off testing opportunity using some of the same tools and some of the same environments that I'll show you today. And lastly, transparency. If I can't remember it, it's not really a simple straight story. I don't have a whole lot of gray matter left to remember complexity. So I believe transparency, reproducibility, and a simple story for customers and analysts and the entire public cloud audience is the way to convince your customers that speeds and feeds aren't really the discussion about cloud. It's effectively everything else, back to my story about on-premise versus cloud sales or cloud, cloud journeys. Uh, to, to cap this off, for most customers, going to cloud is like a data center move. And when I talk with IT directors and leadership for IT, they think of it that way, except it's a little bit worse. They don't actually know what the price is going to be at the end of this process. They have an idea, but that's what they're concerned about. I personally have been a buyer of up to five clouds at once. It is true. So before I kick into a bunch of stuff we've seen or talked about a little bit, let me grab my glasses and we'll start to do a demo. Lee, that, yes. um, quest, that uh, point around technical reviews. Yes. We're on the live feed. Is that just open to the general public? They can email you if they want to hit So problems. Th this is the way it goes. Somebody talks to me or somebody talks to Leo. Leo and I talk to ourselves and we say, is this a good use of our resources? Does this build goodwill? Does it build outbound customer facing assets that we think are good? And is the partner willing to work with me? Because the team is three people. It's Lee, Lee and Lee on my side right now. So I have a little bit of flexibility. We're going to look at my tenancy, my account, and I can provide resources and guidance, but I can't provide a whole lot of hands on time. So it's like that. All right. Let me make sure we don't get a cable mess up. So before I do this, for, for my purposes, has 
show of hands of people who have seen the OCI console that I'm going to show you here. So we launched 2016. Okay, a couple of hands. That's great. All right. So a lot of times people uh, may not have seen it, maybe a little bit surprised by some of the features. So okay. So this is my account. I'm going to so I'm going to take you through the whole process. So I have my own tenancy, Oracle Lee Gates. I log in. I happen to have left looking at the Ashburn region. I'm subscribed to Ashburn, Phoenix, and Frankfurt. We just launched London. I haven't subscribed myself to London because I don't need to yet. Uh, but Tim, to your comment, launching an instance allows us to go in and look at the different versions of both bare metal and virtual machines that I can launch from uh, a single API endpoint call if I'm calling it from API instead of actually looking at the console. This console actually just calls the API endpoints. But we default to a name. We have a set of Oracle images. I could have provided my own. I've uploaded a few that I've imported over time. I have some boot volumes from, well, none in this compartment, but if I had previous booted bare metal or virtual machine instances, I would have those boot volumes that I chose not to throw away or terminate at machine termination time. Are you saying that, yes. the, are you saying, Lee, that those are, those are the two offerings, virtual machine or bare metal? Correct. That's it. So that's the class. Within okay. the class of virtual machine and bare metal, okay. we have machines which have NVMe, drives on the PCIe bus. Okay. Those are dense. We have standard, which has none of those. Okay. It's designed for block volume only because you're only going to write data that you really want protected, persistent, and everything else, right? And you're saying these models exist, or these examples exist for each of those yeah. shapes, yeah. as you put it. Yeah, that's part of why I wanted to skip to this is, let's go to the image virtual machine or bare metal. I can now do VMs because I've selected my right. VMs. Yep. I can now take that same Oracle 7.4. I have a few bare metals. So second generation and first generation, standard and dense with the core count. Naming conventions are simple, right? So continuing on, I won't actually launch it this way. Uh, but I could grow the boot volume to be much larger than default. We've recently enabled that. Oops. And then at the end of the process, I wind up uploading my SSH key, selecting my virtual network. In this particular case, I have a network named Ashburn. That's why it's offering me a network in a named Ashburn. I have a few other VCNs or networks available. Uh, and I could assign a specific, you know, a public IP address as well if I need to. So by default, I'll get assigned one from, um, from OCI. So I'm not going to launch this right now. But I do want to ask questions on this, because I think seeing this one dialogue that's ultimately calling into the APIs that are available for general consumption answers a lot of the questions that we had today about what we talked about. Any, any questions, especially Justin and Jim? OK. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's go run some tests. I'll show you what some tests look like from machines that I started off last night. I left them running. Um, I'm a bad network ad uh, admin that way. But if we go look in our Ashburn compartment, um, sorry, the Phoenix compartment, Phoenix region. And I'm in my performance compartment. I have several compartments. These are partitions, uh, partition boundaries. But I have my performance compartment where I have run four different bare metal instances that I launched. I gave them simple names of their actual class type. But these ran last night. And if I go look at the standard, which has no local NVMe, I chose to attach 32 volumes to it. I gave them super boring names because these are all generated by my script, right? So the names of the block volumes that you see there are super boring because they, they get provisioned and then they get tested and then they go away. 
So how do I do this, right? How do I do this without clicking and doing all this manual activity that, although it's interesting, it's not that much fun. Justin, to your point earlier, we'll go out and we'll start calling, oops. Make sure we get this big enough. We will connect up to an instance that I use to run these tests. So this machine, this CF machine, CloudFree machine, is just a jump host that I use to launch tests programmatically. I've written a very simple script. This script is actually going to do the same thing that the GUI does, the, the console does, because it's operating on the endpoint. I've installed the CLI on this instance, given it my key, allowing it to interact with my account. I do really simple CLI commands, and then I parse the output to present a text menu, and I need to do this because I want to do it quick. Sometimes I want to do testing ahead of my own product teams. So I can't necessarily be dependent on the UI being ready or otherwise. But let's go run a test. First thing I'm going to do is set my region. These pauses that you're seeing here are API queries being issued by the OCI SDK. It's enumerated my compartments. It's enumerating my networks offers me the same networks that I just saw in the UI. Offering me the subnets, I didn't actually show you the subnets, but I have a full network built out. I can go pick my storage profile. I think I need to pick the shape first. Oops. So let's go pick our shape. Let's go run a bare metal, uh, let's run a virtual machine standard, let's try for a big one, 1.16. Now we pick our storage. So the 1.16 has a few NVMe devices if it's dense, but this was a standard we chose. So I'm gonna pick some block. Mm, we'll give it eight block. These are just hard-coded commands that I put in the script to allow it to launch. One terabyte volumes. We go pick our operating system image. So again, hitting the API endpoint, scraping it to build the list of images just like the console does that's in the available portfolio. So we selected our most current uh, uh, Oracle image, Oracle Linux. We already set our region and where we're gonna run. I'm going to choose my test. I'm going to test for IOPS. I'm not going to do any of the purging. So this step right here that I just did, build the TF, that's the Terraform template. We use Terraform for automated programmatic provisioning like many others. And I just said, go create that instance. So what we're seeing now is the output from Terraform. We're spinning up a uh, standard 1.16. Here's my block volumes getting created. And this will go off for a while. So this is kind of a lot of scripting that I've been doing, right? Now if we go look, we'll see that instance being spun up. Let's see, we chose Ashburn, right? There it is. So orange, that instance is provisioning. At the end of that Terraform process, I pull it up. These are the creation of the four, I think, what did I say, four block. It's attaching them as soon as the instance is up and running and attachable. And then it will begin to run the test. So the last, uh, last thing I can do is show you the, um, the test. But basically what it boils down to, uh, let's see. We generate reports, which begin to run at the end of this process. Um, so Terraform has the ability to chain load or run a command after the provisioning is complete. That's when we run, in my case, the performance test I'm gonna show you. So last night I ran some tests. Oh, 
At the end of my test, we go up to put the test artifact or the test result into our object store because I have the CLI present. Let's see, hang on here. There we go. So here's the one I ran last night. It finished up this morning. We will download it and look at it. So I'll show you the more interesting pieces, but basically we see the test results summary. It ran for 11 test passes trying to find the steady state. This particular test runs FIO repeatedly across different block sizes, but you can actually see that initially we saw some performance warm-up time, possibly cache warm-up, but what we're seeing is around 7 through 11, we had 10% or less drift or change in performance from the beginning of the test to the end. So the charts that you'll see back in my slides look like this. So that test ran for about four hours last night, walked across all the block sizes of interest. I don't run 512 byte block size anymore, nobody does. Walks across the seven different reasonable read-write read -write mixes, showing you what the steady state that it found was. It's a good way to talk to infrastructure without getting this into application topology and requirements because this really is an underlying measure of the NVMe performance to all nine drives on this instance. This is a, a generation one instance running it as hard as it could. So with that, let's go back and double check the test that we kicked off. I mentioned that the Terraform begins to kick off the test. The first thing the test does is goes out and updates yum. Kind of like we were talking about earlier, I have to patch my own stuff, right? So let's go take a look at the test quickly. And this will look familiar to some people, I think. We just spin up a test environment, put a screen there, run the test, configure the environment, and then the last thing that I have is a self-termination. Now, I commented this out, but this is the way that we run our tests, run our jobs, and self-terminate to return the inventory back easily <coughs> after we've saved the, the test artifacts. So I spent a little bit of time on this. I meant to have this demo at the end, but I think that it puts back in the context of the slides that I'm going to present. But I thought that this audience might like to see how I constructed the test because this is all running it the same way that a user would run the test. You'd get on the instance, fire up the tools, bring them down, configure them, run the test. <clears throat> so I run this frequently, rerun this you know, nightly across multiple different environments. So back to our slides. Quick question. Yes. How much value do you think that sort of performance difference provides, let's say, in comparison to AWS or Azure? Uh, if, let's say, the majority of my workloads are test dev workloads, and I don't need that massive performance increase. So fortunately, you can run on a smaller virtual machine, which doesn't have the high cost, which doesn't have all the memory of the bare metal, and you can size it up and down across bare metal and 2VM and back. So we like to say, kind of like our discussion earlier about colo concepts in a public cloud, you know, we also have the ability to scale seamlessly between bare metal and virtual machine, which lets you go all the way down to one core and then up to bare metal. Now, obviously, we have to do some reboots, some reprovisioning. You can envision me using those existing boot volumes to go between those instances. But we like to say that we've got a pretty good range to meet somebody who wants to start off small, start off virtualized. Perhaps they need one NVMe drive. That's our smallest, dense virtual machine. Does that help out? Yeah. Okay. All right. I will pick up the pace. Uh, I should probably get this. Thank you. So I won't belabor this slide a whole lot. Um, we've talked about this as well uh, earlier during, during Pradeep's uh, session. Observed that you see on the top row there's a 
and the measurement row, those are observations I made against the SLAs that we've rolled out. So what you, what you see here is we, we deliver performance consistently enough times. We turn around, we say, is there an SLA we can put to that? So the file system, the recently launched NFS v3 file system service, we don't have a SLA yet. We're studying it. We're trying to figure it out. We launched with 150 megabytes per second, trying to put some more parameters around that, figure out what the right answer is if we're going to move forward with an SLA on a shared file system service. The notes, we've talked a lot about industry first on performance SLA today. I'll show you some of my other measurements in just a minute. Um, just a quick question on the SLA. Yeah. If you break the SLA, what do I win? Uh, you, uh, uh, we, we do a review, and then we credit your account. And I'm actually really happy that you, know, you saw a situation that um, we had uh, an impact on your environment. You noticed it. We were able to do something nobody else could do, right? which is actually to deliver performance at this level. We turn around, we say, if there's a problem that we did, not that you did by misconfiguration. So for example, you put RAID 1 on it, you put a host operating RAID system on it, you're not going to get those performance numbers that I just talked about. right? So those performance numbers are not using any old architecture. Because we provide durable block storage, that's what we require is to hit those numbers, you can't be using OS technologies like that to oh, achieve sure. so yeah, th th certain requirements <coughs> like that. Yep. So we don't say we're going to turn your system and get you the performance. This is what the underlying performance ha you know, is when we measure it at SLA. If you do uh, legacy software, other things in your environment, that might be why you came to us, is yep. to be able to put that legacy software on fast hardware and get net-net higher performance. Sure. OK, uh, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. <clears throat> The enterprise architecture, there's a lot more I could put in here. Um, we talked a lot about the private and public network management during Pradeep section. This really is part of the secret sauce for OCI, OCI. The flexibility and the performance of the network is that connective tissue that is surfaced in so many other parts of our service. Leo and I uh, spent a little bit of time on this. If I included rows for our competitors, instead of a summary row like this, you'd see that each of our competitors has some, but not all of what we have. We have most of our offerings. There are a few things we don't have. So for instance, our file service is new. There's some challenges there. But for customers to come in and try to make sense of this is very difficult. And so that's why we go back and say, measure the performance measure the consistent performance, understand the cost for that performance, and then you can move on to a more interesting conversation. So um, again, a uh, couple of uh, uh, common um, observations here in the top row for, the, for our, our side. Um, I've made a point about the VM and the VM architecture. Um, yes, you can run in other clouds. That's true. It takes work to do a blended environment. There's no question about it. The second point, um, with our enterprise focus between high performance local storage, network attached storage on the, on the other end of the extreme, there's a lot of pressure to move data between these different environments for cost purposes or application requirements. This is absolutely creating table stakes to, to tier the data between them or provide the access between them to support those requirements. And that's why we're starting to see a lot of enterprises coming to us and saying, I am ready just to move into cloud. I don't want to change anything else. This is very common. I don't want to change anything else that I don't have to change because this is a data center migration for me. <clears throat> but I need all of these requirements for my enterprise operating systems, whether it be rack or otherwise, kind of like we talked to today, um, <clears throat> and all of the integration services around it. Now, one last point before I get to a couple more charts and, and wrap up. This is my rule of thumb. Excuse me. Yes. The SLA you, uh, you announced in the previous slide about network. Yes. Uh, is it uh, availability SLA or performance SLA? Both. So the availability uh, go back to performance is 90%. So it's 90% of the, so 22.5 is 90% of the actual line rate, the 25 gig. And I have my oh, That's not availability, that's 
uh, percentage of bandwidth. There's a, the, the text is a little bit big. I was, I was struggled on this one, to be honest with you. I wanted to put it in there and I realized it was gonna be an eye chart. So it's 90% of the service rate for 99.9% .9 of the time. So three nines. Three nines at performance, as opposed to available with variable performance. Okay, so your, the SLA isn't that, so I don't have a three nine reachability SLA. Yeah. I have a three nines performance SLA. And reachability, therefore, well, if it's performant, it is reachable. At that performance, right. Yeah. right. So the I'm concerned uh, at overall reachability. Yeah. I can I can deal with lower reachability, but the service is still available. If I get you know five gig <laughs> at five nines. So I'm we had an awesome happy. question earlier about this though. What is your application performance when your infrastructure is v wildly varying. If I have weight versus timeout, there's a big difference. So you're my, my users can deal with weight. They can't deal with down. If if it's effect, if 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 you're already 25 gig is a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. If I'm getting half of that, mm -hmm. I'm extremely happy. So this is where the origin of noisy neighbor comes from. Mm -hmm. And we go back to Pradeep's discussion about committed, reserved, band, non-blocking bandwidth within the AD. So what I've generally observed and heard from other customers who have non-ordinary uh, IT workloads is the variance of noisy neighbor problems is what causes their indeterministic or their high variability of their higher level application. So we think it's better to say, here's the red line we're not gonna move the red line up and down as other people use our network. That's, mm -hmm. that's the point Pradeep was making. And our red line is very high, but if we need to make it a little bit lower, we will. So here we chose 90% for three nines of the time. Question. Uh, earlier I thought I heard you guys say that uh, you don't oversubscribe the hardware. Is that how you can do this, essentially? Uh, I Somebody think Pradeep's about to stand up. We don't oversubscribe within the AD. Okay. So. Within your own data center, we don't oversubscribe. At three nines on the network is up to 40 some odd minutes of downtime per month. Mm. So the actual reachability could be 43 minutes down and you still wouldn't be in violation of SLA. Uh, I don't know the math off the top of my head. It's 40. It, yeah, it's about 40, <laughs> that's about, this is, pretty common the I would have a hard time selling for something like SAP I I couldn't sell I couldn't say I couldn't say you have three nines availability for the overall application I okay, know so we're, we're talking about a single node right so your application oftentimes mm -hmm. is doing memory sharing memory mirroring multiple node things at the application level level to survive those times when right but we're not talking about we're not talking about cloud native applications necessarily we're talking about legacy apps yes like that's been, been the that's... whole selling point all along is that you can bring your legacy app unmodified yes. which those legacy apps are often on node so yeah. let, let, well, let me think tolerate. about right oh, take let me think about this time. take if it a I, step further my, my internal team is not my internal networking team isn't giving me three nines They'll, they may give me three nines availability then I have to build clustering on top yeah. of that to mitigate the risk of the three nines that they gave. <laughs> so I'm assuming you guys are saying we're offering at least what you would get in the typical data center. If you need more than three nines, cluster. Yes, that's right. That's why you have uh, other applications which do uh, mirroring for <laughs> single drive failures as well, right? Whether it's Microsoft or others, we also have rack, right? So we would actually run rack on top in some situations like this to get multiple node rack to work to support situations like we're talking about, such as brief unavailability for one of those rack participating nodes. Because I'm seeing that I'm seeing the same level of availability for compute, storage, et cetera. So I, that, that is my baseline. If I, if I want better, I need to design for resiliency and we know how hard that is though. So, so Yes. I think some of us know how hard it is. Right. 
So this is, what, this is why you're asking these questions, right? Which is, do I really have to replicate or recreate my clustered operating system that was designed, you know, the design point was quite frankly private data centers that you know, we all find familiar, but they're not public cloud. So we are designed to enable those workloads to come over right now, right, without modification. To your point, our goal is the same as on-premise performance and availability or better in light of the time and market that we have, I think we're doing pretty well. And I'm pretty sure that we would be highlighting the lack of um, SLA on some of the other providers. So we actually welcome this conversation. We are in the process of bringing over all of our internal applications as well to run on OCI. And we're having some of the same conversations with them. If I were to adopt one of your database management solutions, um, can you give me a higher, uh, a four nines um, SLA? Because you're then putting high availability in that for me. So then that's the value out of kind of moving to that piece. So you're taking care of that. Isn't that moving to a true cloud-based service at that point? Yeah. Yeah, but I guess. Yeah, that, that would be a huge argument for internally. I could sell that to executives to say, you know what, if we just consume the cloud service natively, all they see is four nines versus three nines. Let's go through the pain of moving the, the database if we're getting four nines versus three. And th um, this moving to this could be a step to moving to that. So uh, depends. It's a lot of work to get into this. Yeah. You get a bit closer. I this guess. is a tough conversation. So that's part of why I was happy to come here today was I actually wanted to inspire you to have a second conversation with us, having had the, a little bit of ability to think about where we are relative to the speed with which we've gotten here. Um, so so I, I think this is good, good conversation. Leo. Yeah, so just a transition. Uh, I think we're running over on our sessions. So if we could transition to database, just to give you a little bit of view of that. Um, I, I think the questions are great. You know, I think, again, there's a range, right? Uh, one of the things that we're talking about here is you have uh, a mix of availability, plus I think Keith, you uh, articulated well, my whole application, right? So we are trying to provide a, a view across those things, not just availability, but access to the storage, access to the backend. Let's switch over to database quickly, just to give you a view of that. So while Sean comes up and starts to get ready, I'll show the two slides. I did updating for block against our generation one and two compute, as well as NVMe in February. Um, and we see approximately the same numbers. So um, testament to our consistency and performance. But again, I invite you all to work with me if you want to do some additional testing.